Welcome back to Cath Lab Outreach. My name's Scott. Today we're going to talk about STEMI EKGs. So when we talk about STEMIs, what we're we talking about? Well, ACS, acute coronary syndrome, is really broken into four different categories. You want to put your patient in one of these buckets to know best how to treat them. So first off, you have stable angina or angina. So stable means that you have a fixed lesion inside the, the coronary system and it allows a set amount of blood to flow. So whenever demand calls for more blood than can fit through that blockage, the patient gets chest pain. Stable angina comes on uh, during exercise or during activity and will go away with rest or nitroglycerin. I had a friend whose dad could mow three stripes on the front yard, uh, sit down, take a nitro, mow, mow three more stripes on the front yard, and sit down and take a nitro. Uh, whenever he could only mow two, they knew something had changed, they went back to the doctor. But that's a good example of stable angina. Unstable angina is more concerning uh, because it comes on at rest. So if you're, if you're sitting doing nothing and that type of chest pain comes on and you're not exerting it, this is unstable angina and uh, indicates a worsening problem. The difference between unstable angina and non-STEMI is simply troponin. So what are we talking about with this? Well, an N-STEMI is a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. Some people new to the field will think that either a EKG is a STEMI or a non-STEMI, meaning not a STEMI. That's not true. In, in, in STEMI and in STEMI, the MI stands for myocardial infarction. So we have, we have heart damage occurring. So an in STEMI is no EKGs that are elevated in that ST segment, but we do have troponin release. In STEMIs come in two forms. Type 1, type 2, not real creative. But type 1 is coronary related. So there's, there's blockages in there that's preventing the right amount of blood flow from happening. Type 2, something else in, this, in the body is asking the heart to perform what it cannot do. So you take someone with sepsis or something like that where you have these really large uh, cardiac output demands uh, because everything's dilated. So the, the heart is asked to do what it can't do. It's trying to keep up. There's no problems with the blood flow to the heart. It's just being asked to do more than it can. If there's damage, it releases troponin. So you can go with, sometimes it's hard to tell, is this a type one or a type two? Someone might have all the risk factors uh, for this to be type one. And sometimes you don't know until you go look. Uh, but if you have somebody with chest pain and uh, their troponin is elevated, but there's no ST segment elevation, then that's an in STEMI. So when we become a STEMI, STEMIs are time sensitive. There's, there's not a lot of research or studies suggesting that in STEMIs, if you can keep them, uh, get them pain free, that there has to be a certain amount of time you need to uh, get that vessel open. But STEMI, on the other hand, is not that way. STEMI is time sensitive. Uh, hospitals have uh, 90 minutes, and it should be a much less than that, but 90 minutes to get uh, a vessel open from the time the patient darkens their door. Uh, there's a lot of STEMI systems of care uh, that, are, that exist to, to work with communities and regions to drive those, those times down. But the real key for a STEMI is the patient coming in. The hospital can be as effective as they want. EMS can be as effective as they want. But if the patient doesn't call, doesn't come in, uh, then late presentation STEMIs are, can be disastrous. So the difference here is the patient will have troponin bump at some point, maybe not during the first few EKGs that are STEMI, but at some point they will have that troponin bump. Uh, the uh, ST segment a myocardial infarction is diagnosed just with the EKG. So what is a STEMI? What actually happens inside of here? Well, inside of our vessels, we have plaques that are in the wall and those plaques, uh, as long as that, that cap is um, intact, really doesn't cause that much of a problem. They, uh, they're not good. You want to stabilize them with statins. But this is a, uh, you can have plaques in there 
have a stress test and pass your stress test. Uh, so how can, how can you have a stress test and then have a heart attack the same day or the next day when you pass that stress test? Well, as long as that plaque is sealed, then there's no problem. But a STEMI is a time-sensitive issue and it's a sudden event. The, the cap ruptures and when that, well, the, what's inside the cap is, is, makes contact with the blood, the body starts to think, hey, we're bleeding to death, and it starts to respond with clot. So as it throws that clot into that area, the body fights clot every day. So it, the, sometimes it can wax and wane. The pain can wax and wane because clot builds up, the body washes it away. The clot builds up, the body washes it away until eventually if there's so much clot, it can't handle that. And that's when we have our heart attack. Here's an example of coronaries under angiography. This is a RCA, right coronary artery. You can see here on the left that the, the, there's a blockage. The one on the right is after the stent has been put in, you can see what that vessel should look like. Uh, but this here is, has been met with clot in that, in that lesion, and now no blood flow can continue. So we've talked about getting an EKG, and we've talked about uh, in basic EKG interpretation in other lectures. What about reading a 12 lead EKG, especially when we're looking for a STEMI? Well, the first thing to do with this is to interpret the rhythm. Everybody, a lot of people like to look for that STEMI right off, but there's a lot of mimics. You know, right bundle branch blocks and uh, atrial flutter at my facility are the two most common causes of false activations uh, for, the, for the cath lab, for the STEMI teams. Uh, so interpret that rhythm. That'll give you a 30,000 foot evaluation of what's going on with this patient and it helps you see those mimics that might be in there. Like we talked about in the last video, people who have a uh, high rate atrial flutter, they may feel really bad. That's a cardiac cause. It's going to show up on the EKG, but that's an abnormal EKG, an abnormal rhythm causing the problem, not a heart attack. So interpret the rhythm first then you want to follow a pattern and we'll talk about i see all leads is a common one that's taught uh, where you're looking for inferior septal anterior and lateral uh, changes on your ekg and then finally we want to look for reciprocal changes reciprocal changes are very helpful in ruling out mimics but you can have significant heart attacks without reciprocal changes and that's you know it's unfortunate but the more you hang around ekgs and cath labs you realize there's a lot of gray uh, there's a lot of things that you're putting this ekg together which is just a snapshot in time it could have it can change the second before and the second after that picture was taken but really core uh putting together the patient's symptoms their history the ekg the entire clinical picture is what you want to do so let's talk about reading the EKG component of this. So this is the standard format for most EKGs. There's a couple other ones out there, but this is the most common. And a, an easy way to track this is to follow the pattern we talked about. So remember in the, in the other earlier videos, we talked about two, three, and AVF are inferior views. They look up from the bottom of the heart. So this is where I start. And then you want to, V1 and V2 are considered septal, uh, but really I like to think as V1 through V4 is just the anterior wall. Uh, so but with the mnemonic there, V1 and V2 cover your septal area, which is that septal wall between the ventricles. Then you have your anterior, and then you have your lateral. And lateral is V5, V6, AVL, and lead one. Remember we talked about those vectors in the first video. Uh, this is, these are all witnesses to the same car crash. And if two people are standing on the same street corner, they should see something very similar. Reciprocal changes work like that witness on the opposite side of that street corner. If, I, if I'm on one side of a street corner and a car crash happens and it comes at me, me and the person standing beside me should both see those cars come toward us. The people on the opposite street corner, their point of view, they would see the car crash go away from them. And that's how you get a picture of the direction of the injury in the heart 
uh, because you're putting these witnesses all together. That's why reciprocal changes really help you with that. Uh, but there are some STEMI EKGs uh, that don't have the, the uh, reciprocal changes as, as evident. So here we've got, when we talk about inferior, this is the lateral wall, or this is the inferior wall of the heart. That's the RCA, and it comes down. This is the PDA, posterior descending artery. When we talk about anterior, this is the LAD coming down the front. It wraps the apex. And then the circumflex runs around the lateral wall. These are obtuse marginals that come off of there. So this PDA can actually be uh, fed by the RCA or by the circumflex or by both. That's how you determine if a patient is left or right dominant. If the, if the RCA, which comes around the medial wall and comes around the back, feeds the PDA, they're, they're uh, right system dependent. If the circumflex is what feeds it, then they're left system dependent. So here's our anterior view again. So you have your right coronary artery coming off. Under here, you'll have your left main that breaks into your LAD and to, and to your circumflex. Anything that comes off the circumflex is called an OM, obtuse marginal. Anything that comes off the LAD on the surface is a diagonal. Uh, the septals are actually perforators that go from the LAD and the PDA, and they perforate, they dive deep into that septal wall between the two ventricles. So when we talk about how the EKG covers this, we can actually kind of wrap our EKG around two, three, and AVF kind of follow that pattern of where the, of where the, the right coronary artery goes. B1, 2, and 3, uh, you said remember 4 is with it there, come lay it right down the front wall of the heart for your anterior, and then V5 and V6 would wrap around. So you can take that EKG that you've printed and kind of mentally wrap it around the chest and where that elevation is that's where it suggests the problems are uh, if that's helpful in remembering uh, what part of the ekg refers to which part of the heart so let's let's practice a little bit here let's follow a pattern first off we talk about interpreting the ekg so this is probably a, a little bit of a first degree heart block we don't have the grids on this one uh, but that's a little bit of a wide PR interval. But our rate is adequate. P waves are there, so it's sinus. So now let's talk about interpreting the EKG. So let's do inferior. And what we're looking for is elevation in this ST segment. Uh, the, the, I was the first medic, as in the first medic class uh, in my area that was exposed to 12 leads uh, 20 some years ago. and they talked about these look like fireman hats. And that was an easy way to, to think about that as a, as a young fireman, a young medic, uh, of what to look for. But we're looking for that ST segment elevation. So here's our baseline, and we are elevated off of that. We want to see two witnesses from the same street corner uh, see the same thing. So here's two, three, and AVF all have elevation. Here's and, uh, septal and anterior. We got some depression in these. When we come down to our laterals, those look okay. We got some reciprocal changes here in AVL and then lead one. In 20 some years, I've, I've never, I used to always say this, I've never seen a inferior MI not have AVL as its reciprocal change. A few months ago, we actually, I actually saw my first one that didn't. So it is rare uh, for it not to have AVL as its, as its reciprocal change, but it is possible. Uh, so this would be an inferior STEMI. All right, so what we have here, we have another EKG. We have our uh, P wave, so, and our rate is good. So we're sign this rhythm. Let's do our, follow our pattern. And we have lead two and lead three have some depression. AVF has some depression. When we follow our pattern to septals, we've got a lot of elevation here on our anterior, septal and anterior leads. When we go lateral, we have some. Uh, here is okay. AVL has elevation. And this has, uh, lead one has elevation. So what do we have? We have uh, 
septal anterior MI, and we have reciprocal changes to confirm that. And so that, that works out pretty well. All right, let's follow our pattern again. Here we have our uh, P waves. Our PR interval looks good. We're sinus rhythm, rate's okay. Uh, so two has a little bit of elevation. Three has a little bit of elevation. AVF has a lot of elevation. Reciprocal changes on our V2. Lateral wall looks okay. Reciprocal change, reciprocal change. Inferior with reciprocal changes there. So this is an inferior wall MI. How about this one? We've got P waves and our rate is okay. We have uh, a little bit of, you, you could argue some elevation there, but not much. Nothing in this one, nothing in AVF. Let's go down through our um, septal and our anterior leads. We see a little bit there in the septal, but our anterior for sure. And you remember, we're talking to plumbers. A, a stent doctor is a plumber. If there's a blockage in a the pipe, they're going to go in and fix it. So a septal and an anterior typically are the same blockage. You know, where the septals come off of uh, the LAD, that is going to affect the other part of the LAD. If it's in the left main before the LAD and the circumflex split off, you're going to see it in the lateral and the anterior. So you're, you're just trying to figure out where this blockage is. That's what a plumber is wanting to do. They want to go in and find this blockage, uh, know which catheter to use to go in and find it the quickest and get that vessel opened up. Uh, so don't think about it when you have more than one wall being involved that you have more than... Uh, you have multiple blockages. It, it, it can happen. You can have multiple blockages during a STEMI. But what you're looking for is the, the more walls involved, probably the more proximal this blockage is, uh, so more of the heart is being affected. So here we have our anterior uh, STEMI. A couple more here. Uh, we've got our P waves. Our rate is, is adequate. Elevation in two, three, and AVF. We got some uh, depressions in our in V2. The depressions in our lateral wall, uh, AVL, and lead one. So another inferior stemming. You're like, come on, Scott, throw something new out there. Well, we basically just have those three walls to talk about uh, that get picked up on our EKG. This one's nice and clear and easy. P waves, rates okay. We have inferior elevation. Uh, we have uh, V2 here is depressed. Let's talk about that just for a second. We've seen a lot of inferiors have V2 with some depression. Is that reciprocal change? Well, the way reciprocal change works is what one side of the heart sees as elevation, the other side sees as depression. So if uh, the anterior wall sees elevation, Anything posterior, even though we're not taking posterior, you'd have to put leads on the patient's back to see the posterior wall. That would see the opposite. Well, V2 sits right on the front of the wall or front of the chest. So if it's showing depression, the back of the heart most likely would be showing elevation. You could confirm that easy enough. Put a couple of these leads on the back, just like this 12 lead EKG. Inferior shows STEMI. So four, five, and six were moved to the back marked as 7, 8, and 9, and ran again. And you can see ST elevation in there in 7, 8, and 9, demonstrating a posterior MI. Does that change your treatment? Not necessarily. Run your EKG again. Just know which leads you move to the back, and you'd be able to see what that posterior wall is actually doing. But here, are we talking about two different heart attacks, a posterior heart attack and an inferior? Well, no, it's probably a proximal RCA blockage that's impacting two walls. There's more walls involved, so the patient is probably more symptomatic. All right, so we have more elevation here in lead two, lead three, and AVF. Reciprocal changes in uh, V2, which is probably that posterior wall involvement. Anterior looks okay, lateral looks okay there, but except in AVL, we have some depression. We have another inferior MI. Here's EKG, what do we see on this one? 
So we're a little bit fast. A heart rate, tachycardia with STEMI is a very bad sign. That's cardiogenic shock that's coming in. I uh, hear some depression in uh, lead two, probably some there in lead three and AVF. Not super clear, but look at this elevation. That's your QRS and that's your T wave. Look how elevated it is. Tombstone elevation uh, in, uh, in all of our anterior leads and our lateral leads. This is probably a, a large section of the heart being involved with this the tachycardia says we're, we're in shock uh, so this is probably a pretty sick patient all right rates up a little bit again our uh, big p waves there we've got no elevation but we do have some in lead three and avf we've got depression in v2 and v3 Depression and AVL, because we have another uh, inferior STEMI. All right, so just a couple more slides. What does this mean? Uh, so I see these things on the EKG. What is that actually, what action verbs do I need to be thinking about? Well, if your left system is involved, that LAD covers your main pumping wall. So if that is stunned with your MI, you can expect cardiogenic shock. So uh, being ready for for pressors to help support that blood pressure that supporting that blood pressure you're really protecting end organs it's actually worsening the heart a little bit you're increasing demand increasing the work but you're keeping those end organs perfused until you can get the pump fixed again what if it's the right system that's involved that R, that rca with an inferior a lot of that supplies a lot of your conduction system like your sa node and your av node so you're trying to watch for these uh, rhythms to be have heart blocks and bradycardias. You'll hear some teach, don't give any nitrates to inferior MIs. Well, if 40% of them involve the right ventricle, that means 60% don't. If the patient's right ventricle is not involved, then they actually can handle nitrates. But the nitrates actually cause dilation. If that right ventricle cannot make up for that loss of preload, that loss of stretch caused by the blood coming back to the heart, it can't squeeze to harder to make up for that loss. So that's why nitrates are dangerous if you have a right ventricle involvement. Can you give nitrates? You can, but you should never give a nitrate without an IV in place because what reverses nitrates? Fluid. It doesn't reverse it. In fact, that it negates its activity, but it fills that volume, that, uh, that void that's created by the nitrates. So you can do right-sided uh, EKGs. We'll talk about that in another lecture. But the, uh, just know that just because you're having an inferior MI, I want to be cautious with my nitrates, but it doesn't mean they can't benefit from that. We talked about the RCA feed in the conduction system, that anterior wall feeding your main pumping. But remember, any, any heart attack can cause a number of systems. Those are general rules. But one thing for sure, all of these patients are susceptible to VF. Uh, they can get into ventricular fibrillation at any time. So if you're treating these patients, get, get defib pads on them. That way you're, you're not relying on uh, time. You, you're already got your pads on. If this person were to fibrillate, you can shock them before they even lose consciousness very much. Uh, they, they may or may not even remember getting shocked uh, because of, it just depends on what the status of their perfusion is at that moment. But they've only missed a few heartbeats because you had the pads on already. All right, I hope this was helpful and we'll see you next time.